Hi, welcome to The Coaching Game. I'm Laurie Lawson, and tonight my guest is Danny Tickton Coplick. I hope I did all that right. <laughs> There's a lot of K's in that name, but I That's like it. <laughs> I like it. And oddly enough, I met Danny um, because Terry Yaffe and I had done a show about biases. And she was very quick to correct me uh, that it's not, DEI is not diversity, uh, equality, and inclusion. It's diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I appreciate that because I had broadcast it all over and I'd have been using it wrong for the whole time. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, but as you might know, uh, Miss Danny is a DEI leadership um, expert, as well as she has an executive coaching and um, consulting boutique. I love that name, uh, the boutique part. And um, so we thought we would not only correct me, but, but move on a little further and um, get into like, where, where are we headed with all this? Uh, well, Lord knows we're aware. It's like, so what do we do with it now that we've sort of got a bit of awareness? I, I like to say, um, I think I'm woke, but sometimes I fail and I'm still drowsy a little. So it's like, maybe uh, Danny's gonna uh, fix us up today and wake us up totally. So Danny, welcome. I am so thrilled to have you on uh, the coaching game. All right, this is just such a thrill. And I wanna, I wanna just give you accolades for being so open to my <laughs> sort of mouthy response, you know? So I do appreciate that. Ah, no, no, no. I, I definitely um, appreciate being, cause I, I plan on using it a lot. I, I read, um, oh, the oh, what's the, the hot book, Cast. I read that book and I decided, and I read that like almost a year ago, and I decided, you know what, this kind of has to be where I'm going to be headed. I'm not sure what I'm going to do because I'm, I'm a white woman wanting to get in there with, um, you know, all the racial inequality and what do I know, but I had, I, so I, I want to be on the right path and I want to use the right words. So I appreciate that from you. Thank you so much. Good, good, good. good. So where are we headed? Um, I uh, personally um, think that we need to pause um, the DEI effort. What happened was, and out of good intentions and out of trying to be woke, companies just jumped in and they, many made performative statements to sort of get the credit. Others tried to create these big programs um, and, and the center, the linchpin of a lot of them was this diversity training or anti-bias training. The truth of the matter is the trainings don't work. And oh, that what? <laughs> they do not work, particularly what? if something is emotionally charged as bias. Racism I put in a different category um, because I don't think you can necessarily change hearts and minds in real time. And so for companies, I say, if you're trying to get rid of racism, forget it. What you can do is have a zero tolerance for it. All right. Wow. So it's not allowed. Zero tolerance. Um, but you can mitigate bias. So my training was in the neuroscience of change, of leadership, of human behavior. And so when you apply some of the tenets of neuroscience to mitigating bias, it's much more effective than a top-down training. There's a lot of learning involved. I think that a lot of companies um, in an effort to be good and woke and appealing and on the right side, uh, you know, engaged companies that maybe were not specialists in this area. So they went back to the same people, whether it's a, a Deloitte or a McKinsey or a Corn Ferry or any of the consultancies had to sort of whip it up fast. This has been an area of interest for me forever, for probably 10 to 15 years, because it started with um, arguing for parity for women. And it's really not that dissimilar in terms of how we level the playing field and, and create opportunity. So um, that's where I started and it kind of morphed and grew and grew. I grew up in Manhattan um, with bleeding heart liberal parents who were sort of on the that then right side of a lot of this stuff, integrating schools and all of that. And you know, my mom's 90 now, if I were to talk about it, she doesn't really understand that those experiments really didn't work well. 
Right. because both integrating was black kids into white schools, but not the other way around. So resources still got spent where resources got spent. Well, how, um, are, how are you defining mitigating bias? How, how that sounds like a good term, sure. but. It's a, it's it it's a behavior, sure, it's a behavioral thing. So first of all, it's important to know how the brain is organized and the brain is organized in terms of two things in its most basic reward and threat. And because survival is the imperative of all living beings, we tend to look more, we scan for danger. So we're much more in the threat category, which is where we just sort of react. There isn't a whole lot of thinking when we react. Reward is great when it happens, that little dopamine hit is fantastic. But when we feel threatened, we go into this uh, fight or flight, we lock down, we don't listen. So there's a way to sort of um, detangle all these biases. And you know, my guru, uh, David Rock of Neural Leadership Institute has created a model where he says there are about 150 known biases, but he breaks them down into five categories. And then you develop a language around discussing these categories. And when you do that, it takes it out of the personal realm and puts it into, um, Lori, you know, I didn't like what you said, that was a distance bias, or that was um, an expedience bias, or that was an experience bias. You know, this happens a lot in hiring or even in meetings, you know, just sort of a, a classic example is, if people are called back to the office, let's or let's go to the before time. In the before time, when people went into conference rooms, but one person was calling in remotely, typically what happened was that person was barely recognized in the conversation. That's what we call a distance bias. We okay. focus more on what's in the room. So an evolved leader or whoever is chairing that particular meeting has to make a conscious effort to involve that remote person in the conversation earlier. Um, there are plenty of the whole other conversation about introverts and extroverts, but introverts in meetings don't tend to speak up that readily. So an evolved leader has to know that it's much more expedient to go to people who are doing me, 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 um, but they have to try to engage everybody. What do you think? Or do you have some parting thoughts or something like that? So that's just a way, but people, if people can say, um, that is a safety bias, or that is a distance, or um, you know, when you can speak in those terms, it helps defang hmm. the intensity of, of the transgression. I also think, um, because I'm about to launch a, a program for smaller companies, which is basically right-sized DEI, for companies that may be intimidated by the big solutions that are out there. This is much more high touch. It is, um, it can be remote, but it's still high touch in terms of starting out with communication skills. Before you even get into any of the DEI stuff, communication skills. Then it's learning about bias and the way the brain works. Then it's naming these biases. Then it's creating um, opportunities to discuss them openly and not to accuse, but to say, this is how this is affecting me. This feels like, you know, it's more expedient for you to promote that person than me. When you can do that, it takes a lot of the emotion out of it, which is really, really helpful. How, how, how willing do you find leaders to, to get into all of this though? I mean, is there an aware, I think there's an awareness out there that, um, you know, it's time has come now and a, a lot of the craziness that we used to put up with, we're not putting up with anymore. But then how, how do leaders let you know that they're willing to get this training? Well, they have to buy in. That's the first thing. If they're going to dispense it to their company, they need to buy in and they need to support it eight ways from Thursday. I mean, they just have to be all in. Um, the truth of the matter is, and you know, they did this with women too, the reason to have women in business, they make the business case. And it irritates me terribly because it's just the right thing, right? And there are certain reasons why women are 
good for business and return greater shareholder value. And oh, by the way, if there were more um, leaders, uh, global leaders who were women, heads of state who were women, I don't think we would have as many wars. I don't think we'd have as much conflict. You know, we would be able to come to some sort of agreement a little bit better. But um, now, now people make the business case for diversity, thinking that's the way to sell it. Bugs me, of course, because it's not right. Um, I mean, it, it, yes, there is a business case because you get more diverse ideas. You don't have group think. You much, you you reflect what the marketplace looks like. You know what your customers look like. The more diversity you have, the the different perspectives. It's just it's all it's all better. But the truth is, what what companies um, are responded to, responding to is sort of market force. So. Large companies may have shareholders and investors who start asking for this stuff. It started with ESG, environment, social governance um, uh, criteria that company has had for investing in other firms. Um, so there's that. And, and that's happening even in the smaller companies. You know, their smaller investors are going to want to see this kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but the real, the, when the rubber meets the road, the real thing that's going to impact everybody is the war for talent. And people who are applying for jobs want to see that it is a um, diverse, equitable, and inclusive culture. And they are going to vet for that. You know, talent is in high demand now and in short supply, or at least qualified. So they have the power to start evaluating that way. And that is a force that bears on companies to start thinking this way. Let me ask you something. Um, I celebrated, uh, there were victories during the pandemic um, and hopefully we won't have to find out some more of them. But uh, one of the thing was, one of the things were that um, they, the, um, we, we redefined essential workers and the people who were kind of at the bottom, it was like, mm -hmm. okay, well, well, you know what, we really need these and maybe we don't need our stockbroker right now, but what we need is yeah, yeah. The, the truck driver who, you know, how do you, has, did that help or did that harm the um, DEI movement for lack of a better word? Did, what, did that enhance it or did it like, just go, oh, you know what? These are these are those people and we are these people. How did that how did that affect it? I think it's a net positive, and, and here's the reason. It's very easy for people to discriminate and pass over and feel racist towards people who are objectified. When you see this pain and you see it in, you know, you're, you're hope, we used to get outside and applaud for the, for the workers, you know, the healthcare workers at seven o'clock every day. Um, I think it humanized a lot of the pain and people saw it up close and understood that people couldn't feed their families, but saw the courage of the people who are going to pick my groceries at Whole Foods so that I don't have to go there and risk my health. So I think that that was a, a net positive. I think that leadership in general was already heading to sort of more, a compassion, more of a compassionate style, but this accelerated it. Um, the problem is human nature. And when human nature gets in the way, like, oh, things are looking better, call everybody back to the office. Is there anybody who didn't know that this was going to spike again in the cold weather. I mean, honestly, you know, so now it's like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that. Everybody go home. You know, here we go again. But I do think that it humanized um, a lot of the distress and the disparity and the healthcare disparity and the wage disparity and all of that. And I think that that helped a lot. That's a good Good point. It did humanize the pain. And but we were all in it together. And I think that's what made it, it was like, this is all we're all here now, you know, there's not, there's no discrimination. The virus did not discriminate. That's right. And money makes no difference, right? It, it only makes the difference is getting equ equitable access to healthcare, which, you know, is something that really needs to be um, looked at. Yeah. You know, but I, I've had a philosophy that was like, you know what, I'm not your mother. I never wanted to be a teacher. 
if you don't know better, I'm not going to mess with you. But I've changed that. <laughs> Thank heavens. It's a little harsh, but it was like, you know what? I'm, I'm too old to teach you. I'm not going to. What, what can we do in order to one, maintain that or remind people, hey, you know what? This was, um, you know, this was humanity. This was, this was, we were all together and we were all suffering and we were all, you know, our priorities change and we, we still don't know what our priorities are. What, what do you, what tricks and tips do you have that we could um, maintain that or bring it back and make it bigger or what, whatever we do with that? How, how do we do that? I don't want to lecture people, but I don't also don't want to let them get away with foolishness, you know? I think, you know, it's you, you pick your battles. If you hear out and out uh, racist, aggressive remark, you have to you have to intercede and just say something. Um, and I don't think that that's limited to what they call allies. That's a whole other conversation, Lori. I don't really like that term um, because it. the way I've heard it described is someone with um, uh, more advantage helps someone with less advantage. It can happen with peers. If I'm standing next to you and someone says something to you, I'm going to speak up. So that, that's a whole other um, conversation. I think it all really starts with internal investigation, you know, questioning yourself. I catch myself a lot. And I told you I was brought up in this really liberal environment. And um, but there are things that just pop into my mind from my past, my, my childhood, my automatic responses when I walk down the street. Um, we have to check ourselves first and then model it for others. And always, you know, I used to think that there was a limited um, place for compassion in the workplace. Um, you know, it's business. You got to do, you know, go get in there, do your work. It's about making money and turning out stuff and making stuff. Um, but I do think that you have to lead with compassion now. And that's the really good news from all of this is that we've, we have become more human. Um, and, and I think we have to both hold ourselves accountable and also cut ourselves some slack because there's stuff we just didn't know. And, and my concern is, um, I've, I, I won't say every day, but I'll say at least once a week, I find something that's like, I never thought of that. I had no idea. And, you know, I'm, I've told the stories before, so I won't tell them again. But, you know, where you just, it's not a part of my reality. So I, I didn't pick it up. I didn't know. Um, and I, I'm just wondering who, who, Who's going to educate me? You know, how am I going to learn? But I, I love what you said: internal awareness and internal education. Um, we just have to stay vigilant because it's so easy to slip on back into yes. the way we were brought up. You know, the way where we were brought up, how we were brought up. Um, Socialization, totally, and um, you know the way we thought about various things and the way we thought about North versus South, or a whole bunch of things. Right, a lot of stereotypes at play, and it takes a lot of work, a lot of cognitive. It's a lot of cognitive load to try to undo that stuff. As you know, it's much easier to um, layer on a new habit than it is to undo an old one. That's just the way the brain works. So eventually the old one will atrophy, but we every day we have to just keep trying to hold ourselves accountable to um, the values that we, we want to have. And, you know, core values stay. I mean, that's your personal brand, your core values. But as time goes on, we get smarter, hopefully, and we get smarter and things get simpler at the same time. And when you can really simplify things down to human to human, it helps a lot, in my, in my opinion. I think that's the only way to go because we can all, especially the, the politics now are just, you know, one side against the other. I mean, we seem to be dividing that. One, one thing I love, again, is that, and I'm not sure if this, how this is going to play out, but that people are not putting up with, with jobs that, that don't respect them as an individual, you know, as a person. Um, and, and no matter where you travel, you're going to see help wanted signs and you're going to see decreased services because they can't find help wanted. Right. I don't know how these people are paying the rent, but God bless, carry on and, and hopefully you'll get your message across. Can, well, can you define the difference between um, systemic racism and implicit bias? They, they, seem, sure. they sure. seem like brother and sister, but what, they, 
Put it down for me. <laughs> it's all under the tent, and I'm going to start with the difference between equity and equality. equality <laughs> Thank you. My education that she gave me. <laughs> give me to the world. <laughs> so equality means everybody is equal. Mm -hmm. Equity means that things are fair. Now, truthfully, not everybody is is equal on a number of different measures. It would be, I mean, clearly, you know, as human beings, the blood and guts and everything else, we're all equal. But in the workplace and in society, it's about fairness. So equity is about fairness. And until there was the DEI acronym, I always wanted I and D, because to me, inclusion is a much more potent um, quality than, than diversity. Diversity is necessary, but it's very transactional. Inclusion is a very different thing. So that's basically that. So systemic, systemic racism or systemic bias happens in, let's say, hiring, where job descriptions go out and maybe they require certain things that only an elitely educated person might be able to fulfill. Um, job descriptions are being rewritten. Sometimes they're written in a sexist way. Sometimes they're written in a racist way, unwittingly, not intentionally, but that is, so that's a systemic bias, a systemic racist kind of a thing. Implicit bias is what we carry around every day with us. Um, so, you know, we can be sitting in a meeting and immediately say, oh, that, that you know, we make a quick association biases are um, shortcuts in our mind. Stereotypes are shortcuts in our mind. It's what we, we when we make a connection, it's, it's a quick association. So implicit bias, unconscious bias is the stuff we're not aware of. One of the problems with these trainings is you go into a, an implicit bias training, how many people are gonna A, say I'm biased in the training, right? The reason they call it implicit is because you can't see these particular biases. They're buried inside. So how can you in a training bring to the surface all of these things that are driving you subconsciously? You can't do it, um, which is why if you can create that other language, that really, that really helps. So systemic has to do with when the system is, is or, you know, how about, um, people in certain neighborhoods can't get mortgages or, you know, that that's systemic racism when certain assumptions are made when you walk in the door. Um, you know, a black person walks in, they assume they don't have the resources, but they do, right? So that is systemic. Um, no promote, um, favoring certain people over others in promotion just because that's sort of a systemically racist thing promotion, hiring, women like that. making less money than men. Yes. Still. That is also, yes. Still. That's systemic. Absolutely. Yeah. The bias underneath that would be people thinking that women aren't as good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. But but it it manifests through that systemic racism, if that okay. makes sense. Uh, no, it, it it definitely does. And and I know they're both I, I will say they're both deadly in their own, you know, if if right. indeed you're on the receiving end of it. Um but I, I think the more we break it down and the more we go, this is this and this is this, and um, you can be, you're capable of it all. Uh, <laughs> I think the closer we'll get to Nirvana, but I think what I hear you saying is that Nirvana is way out there and we have, uh, this is a lifelong process. It's yes, like, it you can't take it, like you said, you can't take one training and, oh, I'm done. I'm, 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 I'm. I'm woke <laughs> and you can't do that because it is a lifelong process of learning and, and be willing to say that, oh, I've been doing this all my life and I'm wrong, you know, um, it, it just doesn't come that easily. So to keep no. up the effort. Um, There's what? a lot of gray area too. A lot of gray area that's still being figured out. Quick example, there's a journalist for the New York Times who is a, um, a linguist, I think. He takes issue with certain things. He's a black man and he takes issues with gestures that he feels are performative. But to me, and I agree, I, I, I don't like performative responses because it's for the, you know, patting him on the back. On a university, there was a big boulder that had been there since 
the 20s, the 10s, something like that, 1920s. And um, students mobilized, the Black students on campus mobilized to have it removed. And I'm going to say a word that's not a nice word, but we're out here, we just got to say it. So the reason the Black students didn't like this big boulder was because back in the 20s, there was one person who called it, pardon me, a nigger head. So they wanted it removed because it was triggering. This journalist said, well, my problem is it's just a rock. It's just a rock. And the, the university responded, they did remove it in a very knee jerk, reflexive way. So there's arguments on both sides. One, if something's triggering, it's triggering, right? It's perception. We all know that everybody's perception is different and perception's reality to people. Um, on the other hand, I understand that the, the response to sort of a performative gesture. However, to me, the thing is have an open conversation about it and vet all the issues and figure out what really needs to be done. Should it be renamed? Should, you know, there are, anyway, gray area. So I just raised that for the gray Definitely area. Definitely gray. And my fear is, um, especially with, oh, dare I say the Me Too movement. Um, hallelujah, <laughs> long time coming. I celebrate you, I'm, I'm there. But um, to take it to a degree where, you can't handle your own problem. You know, it, it's, I, it kind of makes me crazy. It's like if you're a grown woman and you don't know how to you know, deflect an unwanted advance, ooh, I, I don't know where you've been, you know? It's not, but I'm not saying that, you know, I, I can see where it would, if it affects your job, if it affects your mental health, but it's like to take it too far. Um, you know, like the Columbus statue that's um, in Central Park. Does it come down? Does it stay up? How, where do we stop it? And do we, should we stop it? Should we just wipe everything out? And I think that bears a, a long discussion and yes. to see where we go, you know? Um, and I'm not saying I don't support me too. I certainly do. Um, but it, it's just, it, choose your battles. You said that. Choose your battles. Yeah, yeah. And I think when something is bad or toxic in a situation, we tend to go all the way to the nth degree. Yeah. And then it just sort of has Bring to come back, back, the pendulum life, right? back and forth. Exactly. Yeah. And then it eventually works itself out. But there's this immediate rush mm -hmm. to, you know, demonize or, or whatever. And um, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. There are a lot of things that just go too far, um, you know. That's okay, because we only have 30 seconds left, do you believe right. that? <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's good. We'll have it. I'm going to thank you so much for being a part of this and for correcting me and for educating me and um, all of that. And I think that we all need to do that. Let's end this year by saying, you know, we're going to all become more aware. Um, Danny and I thank you so much and I know I'm having you on my radio show and I'm looking forward to that so me too thank you thank you thank so much you're very gracious host thanks thank you thank you <laughs>